Um, it's really an honor and a delight for me to be here and have the opportunity to visit your charming country. When I told my friends and colleagues back in the States that I was going to Slovenia, everyone had heard of it, but no one knew where it was. So I can now go and tell them it's in the perfect place. So, all right, so sex differences in the brain, fact or fiction? Well, we'll start with, with all of the facts and then we'll come back to what might be the fiction. So sex differences in the brain are determined by at least three factors. Hormones, genetics, environment, and experience. So it's the perfect example of interdependent processes. In humans, environment and experience are probably dominant and they're impossible to control for because every individual is going to have their own unique experiences and their own unique environment. And so it greatly challenges to us to try to dissect out the biological um, from other influences. So to understand the cultural influences on sex differences in brain and behavior, we have to understand the biological influences first to remove or to understand that source of variability. And that can only be achieved by using animal models. We can use different animals to ask different questions. So for example, we can study birds in which predominantly the males sing and display courtship behaviors and the like. We can use very simple models like the worm C. elegans, which we can identify every single neuron and we know every single gene. And then of course we can use rodent animal models such as mice with the tremendous power of our ability to manipulate their genes and not release them into the environment. Um, and then also uh, naturally occurring behaviors in rodent models such as in voles, some of which are monogamous, some of which are polygamous. My own personal animal model is the laboratory rat, in part because we have over 50 years of research on this animal model, so we have a very strong foundation from which to build and further our understanding of the biology. So sex differences in the brain and behavior can be divided into three general types. This is just an operational definition. They're not absolutes. There's many exceptions. There's a great deal of overlap. But it gives us a, a handle from which to work um, for further study. So the first type is our classic true sex dimorphism. Di meaning two, morph meaning forms two completely different forms of an endpoint in males and females. This is often occurs in the reproductive realm. So things such as stylized copulatory behaviors, parenting behavior in many species, territorial aggression versus postpartum aggression, these are things that will occur quite uniquely in one sex versus the other. Alternatively, we can have what is, is just a sex difference. It's the same form, but it varies along a continuum, and the average response of males and females might vary along that continuum. Examples of this are responses to stress and anxiety, pain thresholds, food preferences, many, many, many others. This is in some ways the most common of sex differences is along this type of format. A third is a little bit more unusual as what I've termed sex convergence, which is that sometimes the sexes appear the same, but how they've got there is through very different ways. Uh, this can involve in some species we have to evolve unique ways to invoke parenting by males because the males don't go through the hormonal changes of pregnancy and lactation. Um, or there's, gonna, there's evidence of sex differences in problem solving that probably have separate neural underpinnings. And I'll come back to that towards the end of the talk. So what are the sex differences in the brain? Well, they come in many sizes, shapes, varieties, forms. So the size of a particular structure or a subnucleus might be larger or smaller in one sex versus the other on average. The number of synapses made between neurons in a particular brain region can vary dramatically between males and females. This is harder to study and so tends to be less well characterized. The neurochemical phenotype of particular neurons in a particular brain region might vary on average so that you would have uh, more oxytocin neurons in one brain region of, of, of females versus males or more vasopressin neurons in one region of males versus females. And then lastly, just the activation of the physiology of neurons in a particular brain region either at rest or in response to stimuli might change. And we tend to see these kinds of sex differences in studies of fMRI where we look at activation of the brain in response to different stimuli in, in men and women. <clears throat> 
So as I said, we can measure these things uh, in, in both humans and in animals. So we can do things like measure the size of the corpus callosum based on an MRI image. And what you're seeing in the next image here, these are cross sections through a rat brain where we would have cut the brain this way. And that dark staining area is a nucleus called the sexually dimorphic nucleus, known as the SDN, because it's about five times larger in the male rat brain than the female rat brain. But then we can also measure individual neurons. And you're looking down here at the staining of two neurons in the hippocampus. These are called pyramidal neurons. And we can do things after we've stained them so we can visualize them. Uh, we can measure the length. This image is at a magnification about 100-fold larger than what the actual neuron size is. Right? So we do all of this under a microscope. So as I said, there are multiple interdependent processes that determine sex differences in the brain. But at this point, the best characterized variable that is truly biological are hormones. And so I'm going to spend a lot of time now talking, not a lot of time, the rest. I'm going to start talking now about hormones and how they impact on sex differences in the brain. So in mammals, everyone has a genetic sex. We are either XX or XY. Uh, and what those sex chromosomes do is determine whether or not your bipotential gonad is going to develop as an ovary or a testis. The male Y chromosome has a single gene called the SRY gene for sex determining region of the Y chromosome, which will code for the development of a testis. In the absence of that gene, an ovary will develop. Subsequently, the gonadal phenotype will then determine the brain's phenotype by secreting steroid hormones. So the male testis will begin steroid production very early on. In humans, it will actually occur uh, during the second trimester. Sometimes the woman doesn't even know she's pregnant. In the absence of steroids, the brain will develop as a female phenotype. In our rodent models, or in some circumstances that have happened in humans, we know that if we give the hormone, we can actually change the phenotype of the brain uh, to the male by giving male hormones. I like to think of this as mother nature being rather clever and saying, I don't really care about the genetic sex of the organism. I want to make sure that the gonadal sex and the brain sex are well matched. Because the purpose, of course, is always to promote effective reproduction for transfer of genes down to the next generation. This change to male versus female phenotype of the brain occurs very early in development. And as I said, in humans, it will begin during the second trimester very early on. In our rodent models, we know exactly when it occurs because we can manipulate them. And what you're looking at here is the, the blue peaks and valleys are testosterone circulating in the fetal circulation. Many people tend to think of testosterone and estrogens as hormones that only appear at puberty. But in fact, the whole hypothalamic pituitary gonadal axis is fully mature in utero and completely active. So the male fetus will begin producing very copious quantities of testosterone, uh, which begins in the rodent embryonically in the last couple days of pregnancy and continues the first couple days after birth. In humans, a newborn human male baby has a circulating testosterone of a 25-year-old adult. Then that testosterone will go away as that reproductive axis is silenced and will remain silenced, hopefully, for a good 12 to 13 years until puberty reemerges. We call this early period of hormone exposure the organizational period. And it will determine how the hormones post-pubertal will act on the brain, the activational period. One of the advantages of our rodent animal model is that this period does extend into the postnatal period, so after the animals are born. And we can identify what's called the sensitive period for this organization. We identify it by giving injections of testosterone to female rats and asking if their brain has turned into a male rat brain. Once we get outside of the sensitive period, the female no longer responds to this injection of testosterone. Her brain will forever stay female. So how do we connect brain sex differences to sex differences in behavior? 
It's very challenging because we can't manipulate the brain the same way we can do, say, peripheral organs. But what we can do is determine the cellular mechanisms. So if we know that hormones are causing brain changes and we think brain changes are correlated with behavioral changes, we want to identify what it is that the hormone is regulating to change the brain and subsequently the behavior. And I'll just call that factor X because it could, for, for every different brain region or endpoint, it can be a different factor. And one of the things that we can do once we've identified factor X is that we can block it and show that it blocks both the brain change and the behavioral change. And that's how we make uh, our logical connections. It's really strong convergence. We can't absolutely prove our hypotheses when we're working in the brain in this nature, um, but we can use strong convergence. So to return to the type one of sex dimorphism, copulatory behavior in the rodent is highly sexually dimorphic. The males show a mounting behavior of the female, and the female adapts a sexually receptive posture called lordosis. Um, so they show a very different motor response when it comes time to copulate. And we know exactly what brain area controls this in the male. It's called the preoptic region. It has nothing to do with vision. It's only named that because of its proximity to the optic nerve. Um, this is a brain region where neurons are full of receptors for steroids, so they're very responsive to steroids. Um, and if we lesion this brain region, the male will lose all interest in sex. If developmentally we put the steroids only in this brain region, he will become masculinized in terms of his sex behavior. If we give females testosterone very early in life, in adulthood, we can get them to mount like a male when we give them activating levels of testosterone a second time. So as I said, some brain regions are larger than others, but also the synapses are different in males and females. And one of the things that my laboratory has focused on is a particular type of synapse called the dendritic spine. Part of the reason that we focus on it is because it's easy to measure, easier to measure than other types of synapses. Because dendritic spines are what they sound like. They're these little tiny protuberances off of neurons. And once we visualize the neuron, we can actually just go in and count them. Or we can use quantification of proteins that are found only in those spines and ask if they're different in males and females. So what we did is we just asked the very simple question, is there a sex difference in dendritic spines in the newborn brain of rats? And this is what rats look like when they're newborn, little pinkies. Um, so we collected them on the second or third day of life, dissected out this brain region, and then quantified. And what we found is that the males had almost over twice as many dendritic spines as the female. We quantified this in two ways. One is that we measured a protein in the spines called spinophilin, so it's spine-loving. And what you're looking at here is what's called a western blot. Each one of these little black dashes is the preoptic area from a single animal. So you can see there that all of the males have much more of this protein than all of the females. We also visualized the neurons through an ancient process called Golgi impregnation. It was actually developed in the 1800s by Ramoni Cajal and his, colle his colleague Golgi. And what you see, these little feathery things coming off of this process, those are the actual dendritic spines. And we can go in and count them. And they matched perfectly to the protein. Males have about twice as many as females. So once we've characterized a basic sex difference, we like to ask, how did it come about? And was it regulated by hormones? So if we treat the newborn female with male hormone injections, will she then have a male pattern of synapses? So we treated her on the day of birth and the next day and measured at the same time that we had before. In this case, the hormone is actually estradiol, which is actually an end product of testosterone. It's a little confusing in this case. Don't think of estradiol as a female hormone. It's actually a masculinizing hormone during development of the rodent brain. And what you can see is that estradiol does, in fact, dramatically increase the number of spines. And it's shown down here with that same Western blot. This is our blocking of factor X experiment here, uh, which I'll explain in a minute, because that's the question. What is factor X? What is the steroid turning on? In this case, it turned out to be an extremely unusual and unexpected player. Prostaglandins you might have heard of as the things that give you a fever. Right? They are a lipid-derived signaling molecule that acts on your brain to raise your body temperature when you're sick. 
Turns out, though, rather unexpectedly, that prostaglandins are also very potent normal regulators of brain development. And in the rodent, actually, this is occurring at a time in life when this animal cannot get a fever. So we can't go around changing the brain by getting a fever. Uh, it would take me a very long time. Well, so I'm sorry. So, so next we had to ask, is this indeed factor X? There was reasons why we came to this conclusion that it was going to be prostaglandins. And the way we do that is, is that we treat with the prostaglandins and then we look for the brain changes. So just as we did with the hormones. And when we do that, we see that in fact the prostaglandin looks exactly like the steroid. So there's the estradiol and there's the prostaglandin. So here's the female the female with estradiol, the female with the prostaglandin, the female with estradiol plus prostaglandin, so it's not additive. And here's a different prostaglandin to show us specificity. It's only this one particular type of prostaglandin, PGE2. So we had, in fact, fulfilled this part of the equation. Then it would now take me a very long time to, to explain what prostaglandins do because we've actually drilled down very, very deeply into the cellular processes that are occurring. And it's much easier and more fun to actually just put it all together into a single cartoon um, that shows the complexity of the cell-to-cell -cell communication and the signal transduction processes that are being activated. So we start with testosterone is going to be converted to estradiol. Estradiol binds to intracellular receptors called ER. These are transcription factors that go to the neuron, uh, to the nucleus, and transcribe the gene cyclooxygenase 2, which makes prostaglandins. The neuron releases the prostaglandins and actually acts on neighboring dendrites to the prostaglandin receptors EP2 and 4, activating adenylate cyclase, which leads to activation of protein kinase A, causing clustering of AMPA glutamate receptors. Second step is we get release of calcium, of glutamate from astrocytes in response to calcium. That glutamate binds to those clustered glutamate receptors on the dendrite, and that causes the dendritic spines to form. So there's a couple things about this story that are kind of fun. One is that it involves two different cell types, both the neuron and the astrocyte. Astrocytes are a form of glia. And the other is that it involves communication from one neuron to another neuron. So this allows for all the neurons in a particular neighborhood to change their phenotype in response to the hormone. We have found that these cellular events that set the synaptic patterning early in life will persist all the way to adulthood. So somehow the cell remembers that it's supposed to have its dendritic spines spaced a, a certain distance. And we believe that this is epigenetic, but I'm not going to go into that today. But what about behavior? Did that really change the behavior? How can we get from that brain change to behavior? Well, to do this, we do the same experiment as before where we're going to treat with the prostaglandins early on, only now, I'm, I should have X'd out, to, excuse me, I should have X'd this out because we're going to raise the animals to adulthood and we're going to test them for their reproductive behavior. And here's what it looks like when we test animals for reproductive behavior. We do it in glass aquaria and we, we watch them. We actually videotape them. It's a little rat pornography. Whoops. Sorry. Let's do that again. And what we do is we um, measure the latency to the time to which the male rat mounts the female rat, and we measure how frequently the male rat mounts the female rat. And you can see on the top, those animals are mating uh, quite actively. We've made sure that that female is sexually receptive by giving her hormones. There, that was textbook right there. That was classic male mount female lordosis. So you can see that the pair of animals on the top are going to show a lot of reproductive behavior, although they explore a little bit as well. Uh, you know, life can't be all about having sex. Um, <laughs> and uh, the animals on the bottom, the male very much knows the female is there. He's paying a lot of attention to her, but he's not interested in mating with her. And this goes on for 30 minutes, and we do this several times till we get a very good characterization of the animal's behaviors. And while this looks like we have a male and a female on the top and a male and a female on the bottom, what you're actually looking at is the top is two females, one of whom was treated with prostaglandin when she was a newborn and then raised to adulthood and given activating doses of testosterone. The male on the bottom was treated with an inhibitor to factor X indomethacin, which prevented prostaglandin production during this sensitive period, and he lost all interest in sex. Uh, throughout life. We actually quantify this behavior, and as you can see here, this is based on the latency to mount. These are normal males. 
and this is the female treated with the prostaglandin, this is the male treated with the inhibitor, and this is normal females. So we've completely sex reversed their behavior. So that's a type one sex dimorphism that we have correlated very strongly a brain behavioral change with it, a brain phenotype change. Let's go quickly to a second type of this uh, sex dimorphism, which is that sexually dimorphic nucleus that I mentioned, the SDN, which is some five to times larger in males versus females. So it's that dark collection of, of spots. Each one of those black dots is a single neuron. Uh, if we treat the female neonatally with testosterone and look at the SDN in adulthood, she has now a male-sized SDN. There's an analog to this nucleus in the human brain, generated a lot of excitement when it was reported in the 1980s. Um, it's, the sex difference is not nearly as dramatic as it is in the rats, but it nonetheless is there. So one could ask the question, how does this sex difference come about? There could be multiple ways, right? You could say, well, because males start with more neurons and more neurons survive in males, males make more neurons, or something of that sort. But in fact, the work of Art Arnold and several other investigators have found over the years that males and females start with the same number of neurons, but since the male gets the estradiol from his testosterone, his neurons survive, but in the female, they die. And they die during a specific sensitive period. And as a result, the male's SDN is much, much larger than the female's. Now, we know that this is a general principle for a way to make a brain region larger in one sex versus the other. And we know this is true for multiple other nuclei, all of which are directly related to reproduction. So this was considered the only way to get more neurons in one sex versus the other. But as I said, there are other types of sex differences, right? Many that are not true dimorphisms, rather just variances and averages along a continuum. So we turn our attention to the hippocampus. This is a brain region not directly involved in reproduction. Instead, it's the major brain region that controls the stress response and spatial learning. It's very, very heavily studied for its role in learning and memory. Both of these two things show differences between males and females. So we first asked, is there a sex difference in cell death in the hippocampus? After exhausted studies, we could find no difference in the number of neurons that die during development of the male versus the female hippocampus. So then we asked the opposite. Is there a difference in cell genesis between male and female hippocampus? To study cell genesis, you take a different approach in which you give a drug called BRDU, bromodeoxyuridine, which you will recognize as an analog of DNA. And it becomes incorporated into a cell when it divides because the DNA is replicating. We can then use antibodies to visualize the BRDU, and we can thereby date the birth of a new cell. So what we did was injected animals, uh, females, with male hormones. We compared, compared males and females in the presence of BRDU to ask, are you making more neurons? We collected the brains some days later. What you can see is if you first just look at the female versus the male, is that there is a dramatic sex difference. The male is making many more neurons than the female during this period of time. This is in the couple of days after birth. And the image that you see over here, this is the hippocampus. All those little black dots are newly born cells. And this is the male or female who's making fewer of these newly born cells. We can conclude that testosterone stimulates cell genesis in the developing male brain. But at that point, we can only conclude that they are cells, not that they are neurons. I misspoke when I said neurons. We have to ask, what kind of cells will they become? Because stem cells can become multiple things. They can become neural progenitor cells, which will lead to principal neurons, such as the pyramidal neurons of the hippocampus or interneurons, or they can become glia that will become oligodendrocytes that make the myelin, or the astrocytes that I spoke about earlier. To find out what kind of cells they're going to become, we co-localize the BRDU with specific cellular markers for neurons versus astrocytes versus oligodendrocytes, and we found that 70 to 80 percent of those new cells in the male are going to persist until at least early adolescence. That's the latest date that we looked. So he's making way more neurons than the female at that time. 
So one would think that the male's hippocampus would be leaking out of his ears, right? But yet, the male hippocampus is only slightly larger than the female hippocampus. So there's some additional process that's going on that we have not yet discovered. We are assuming there's a compensatory cell death at a later time that we haven't uh, found, because as I said before, we've looked for cell death and we hadn't seen it. So what are these new cells in the male hippocampus doing? Why is he making so many new cells? We really have no idea. But uh, we have some, some hypotheses, but I'm going to segue a little bit into what is it the hippocampus is doing? Well, it's critical to stress responding, and it's critical to spatial learning. It's also critical to olfactory learning. And one possibility is that the male has to learn the scent of his mother early in life so that he can avoid mating with his mother as an adult. Because remember, we're talking about rats, and life is very short. And they're ready to start mating within two months of birth. Uh, but what about this uh, spatial learning this, that I talked about earlier is different in males and females. And it's often touted as one of the largest sex differences in cognition in males and females. And I would make the case that this is an example of our third type of sex difference, sex convergence. So how do we know that males and females are different in spatial learning? A very commonly used task is called the Morris water maze. And basically what you do is take a large cauldron of water, something the size of a, a baby's swimming pool. You fill it with water. You make the water opaque by putting in powdered milk or something of that sort. And you submerge a platform in the water, put the rat in the water, and they don't like it. They don't like to be in water. This isn't a good thing. They're a terrestrial animal. And they will swim around quite frantically until they find the platform. And they, you do this over and over and over again until the rat learns the way to the platform. This is considered a measure of spatial learning. And how long it takes the rat to find the, the platform uh, is a measure of their learning. So the quicker they are to the platform, the better learner they are. And many people have stated that males are better at this task than females. However, if you control the testing parameters, you will find that, indeed, males do outperform females when the test is stressful. There are no global cues available in the room, meaning there's no windows, there's no posters on the wall, there's nothing. It's just a blank room. And the platform is very hard to see. However, females will outperform males when there's preconditioning and removes the stress, meaning you get them used to the pool. The global cues are made available that they can pay attention to. And the platform is made visible. Thus, males and females are using a different strategy to solve the same task. And this, in fact, becomes most evident when you just throw the rats in the pool and say, swim for your lives, swim to the platform. And what you find is that the male rat, he says, sure, I'll just swim right straight to that platform. And the female says, are you crazy? There could be sharks in that water. I am not swimming straight to that platform. I am swimming along the side of the pool, and then I'm going to dash over to the platform at the last moment. If we are measuring their performance based on latency, who wins? The male. He gets there first. If we're basing their performance on clever strategy and who might survive the best, well, you could argue that perhaps the female is having the better strategy. So what about in humans? Uh, in a review by Elizabeth Spelke in 2005, she noted that in navigation tasks presenting both landmark and geometric information, women tend to rely more on the former and men on the latter. So that means that basically if you ask a woman how to get to the grocery store, she'll say, you're going to go down until you see the gas station, and then you're going to turn left until you see the Piggly Wiggly, and then it's going to be on your right. If you ask a man, he's going to say, go 1,000 yards north by northeast, and then you're going to take, you take a 45-degree you know, a, a turn, and et cetera. So, Th that's the difference. Um, and if we, again, they're using different strategies, men and women. And if we equate the, uh, the cues, we can equalize the performance. So what about other human sex differences, which is what we all ultimately get interested in? Well, one is toy choice in children is clearly sexually 
dimorphic. Anyone who has a boy and a girl child knows that they're going to be completely different in what they play with. But of course, we also all know that the grandparents are only going to buy the granddaughter dolls to play with, and they're only going to buy the grandson trucks and uh, blocks and things of that sort. So is this just a purely cultural influence, or is it biological as well? Well, one thing we can do is we can ask, what do primates want to play with, since their grandparents don't buy them toys? And in fact, what you find is that they also show a sexual dimorphism in toy choice. So on this side, you're looking at a girl, rhesus monkey, and she has a doll, and she's inspecting its genitals, because she wants to know, is it a boy doll or a girl doll? And this is a male rhesus monkey who, out of the pile of toys that he was presented with, picked the one that moved and made noises. This truck actually has a siren and lights. Um, this does not mean that boys do not like plush toys. All sorts of little boys have their favorite stuffy and things like that. And it does not mean that girls do not like to build with blocks. There's an enormous amount of overlap. But we can use this as a scientific tool. And this has been done by great effect uh, by a woman named Melissa Hines, who has made her career studying girls with a condition called congenital adrenal hyperplasia. This is a genetic condition in which steroid synthesis by the adrenal gland is shifted towards androgen production because a particular enzyme is mutated that normally produces glucocorticoids. And steroid production is a little bit like a plumbing system, and if you block up one pipe, it will overflow into another pipe. So this results in the masculinization of the genitals in the girls, it's partial masculinization, so they're born with a partially fused labia and an enlarged clitoris. And they have been used and to ask the question, since they've been exposed to androgens in utero unequivocally, because only androgens could masculinize their genitalia, um, has this also impacted on their brain and their behavior? And they have been the subject of intense investigation. One of the things that Melissa Hines did uh, is that she asked about their toy choice. Right? And so they would lay out a selection of toys for the children to choose. And this is a little bit hard to see, but I'll help you through it. As this is plays with girls' toys. These are unaffected girl, uh, yeah, these are unaffected girls. These are girls with CAH, and these are unaffected boys and boys with CAH. Here is plays with boys' toys. Here's unaffected girls girls with CAH and boys with and without CAH. Now, there's two things that you can notice. The CAH girls are much, much closer to boys than they are to unaffected girls. The second thing you can notice is that there's a huge amount of variability, right? So that there's lots and lots of overlap. There's some CAH girls that are going to play with girls' toys, and some boys are going to play with girls' toys, uh, and vice versa. One of the things that you also might be thinking is, well, we do all, as parents, push our children towards gender-typed toys. And this is absolutely true. And Melissa Hines is very aware of this as well and has, in fact, set up tests to specifically ask about the influence of parents on toy choice. And in unaffected boys and girls, there's a huge influence of parental push towards the appropriate toy choice. Interestingly, she found that CAH girls were particularly resistant to this push from the parents and would persist in their choice of the boy toy, uh, regardless of pressure from their parents. Another sex difference that we can look at in humans that's informative is called rough and tumble play, which is basically just the way children play. We, we call it that because what it is is that we can quantify the frequency at which they physically interact with each other um, and the intensity with which they physically interact with each other. This is true in children. It's true in puppies. It's true in, uh, well, let me say what is true. What is true is that boys play rough and tumble more than girls. And the reason that we're particularly interested in this behavior is, is because it's act, it occurs before puberty, before pubertal hormones, but after developmental hormones. So it's actually occurring during that window of time when there are no hormones around. So it's independent of hormones. Boys show much higher levels of rough and tumble play in humans, in primates, in puppies, in goats, in colts, in rats, in mice, in voles, and just about any species that we can measure play in. This is one of the most robust and reliable sex differences across species. And Melissa, or Sherry Berenbaum, sorry, in the States at Indiana University has also looked at this in CAH girls. These are just two different studies, just because whenever you're doing studies on humans like this, you want to make sure that you completely reveal all the data and, and give every opportunity for accuracy. And what you can see is that on average, the CAH girls play rougher than the control girls. But these are the individual girls. 
And these are put here for a reason, for you again to see the enormous overlap. There are many unaffected girls who play rougher than many of the CAH girls. So the hormones are providing a prediction of behavior, but by no means a determination of behavior. And then one just last fun example. This is research that was done in Japan uh, by a distinguished investigator named Arai, who was also interested in studying CAH girls because he'd spent a career studying rats, and now in his retirement he turned to girls. And he wanted to ask what's going on uh, in their mind. And so he asked them to sit down and draw. So that these were children between three and five years old, and they were just given a blank sheet of paper and a new box of crayons and told to draw whatever came to their mind. What this shows up here is the characteristics of the drawings. And again, you can't see this very well, but 98% of the girls drew a drawing that had a person in it um, and a flower in it. Only 25% of the boys drew uh, drawings that had people in it, but 93% of the boys drew something that had a moving object, a car, a train, a plane, etc. So in general, what the girls did was is that they drew a line, a house, two parents and a child, flowers, and a sun in the corner. Boys had no horizon, they had no, um, they often had a top-down perspective and they had a lot of frenetic energy. Then he also, at the end, made them give back the box of crayons and he weighed the crayons so he could get a sense of their color palette. The girls all used up the flesh-colored crayon um, and then the boys, and they tended to use the yellows, the oranges, the reds, the warm colors, whereas the boys tended to have a much darker uh, blue, grays, blacks, uh, browns palette. And so these are some of the drawings of just the unaffected children. As I said, you can see, well, first of all, you can see that it was done in Japan. Um, and you can see the girls, so they've got the flowers and the sun and the, the jump roping and stuff. And then these are the boys, and lots of movement, tremendous amount of frenetic movement, often with no horizon whatsoever. And these are two drawings from two different CAH girls. Um, and the one on, on the top is obviously of, of a car. The one on the bottom is a giant fish swallowing a town. So she has sort of incorporated both styles, right? She's got a lot of warm colors, she has buildings, she has a, but she also has a giant fish uh, swallowing a town. Okay, so I started by asking sex differences in the brain, is it fact or fiction? Um, I think that there's, lot, there's unambiguous fact that certainly in the animal kingdom there are tremendous sex differences, and it's not a surprise because a lot of them are there for purposes of reproduction. But things like this are fiction. So this was the cover of Scientific American six years ago, and the notion that there's such a thing as his brain, her brain, um, is, is not only inaccurate but dangerous because it does promote the idea of determinism and unitarianism that a female is a female in every respect and a male is a male in every, also every respect. But a much closer to fact is sort of a mosaic view of the male and female brain, that every different part of the brain is more or less masculinized or feminized, and this, there's over, tremendous overlap between males and females, and we should never go around saying his brain, her brain. And then there's another important set of facts, and the reason that I study sex differences in the brain is because not just, you know, so a woman will someday be president of the United States, uh, but is because of the uh, tremendous health uh, consequences of your gender. So, for example, if we look at autism, it has a skewed sex ratio of three to one, boys to girls. This has actually recently been raised to four to one. Dyslexia, three to one, boys to girls. Attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, uh, it's 10 to one. U.S. teachers know full well that this has a cultural component to it as well, um, but there's probably a biological contribution. Eating disorders, on the other hand, hugely biased towards females, anorexia nervosa, 13 to one, women to men, anorexia bulimia, three to one, women to men. The whole constellation of affective disorders, depression, compulsion, panic, anxiety, two to one to women worldwide. There's no culture where it's ever been found to be the same. Schizophrenia is particularly interesting because early onset schizophrenia happens right around puberty, teenage boys, three to one boys to girls, whereas late onset schizophrenia, postmenopausal women outnumber men six to one. Males are at much higher risk of developmental onset disorders such as autism, dyslexia, ADHD, early onset schizophrenia. These are frequently disorders of wiring, synaptic connections, projections, etc. Whereas females are at higher risk of adult onset disorders, depression, anxiety, anorexia, uh, bulimia, and these are frequently disorders of neurochemistry. 
So that's why many of us feel that it's vitally important to continue the study of sex differences in the brain. And in fact, we think it's so important that we've started an organization called this Organization for the Study of Sex Differences. And we'll be holding our meeting this June in my hometown, Baltimore, Maryland. So if you want to come to the States and you want to go to come to a fun meeting, come to Baltimore. And then I'll thank all the people who did the actual work and generated the data. And thank you for your attention. Um, I have this question. Uh, but you say that uh, hormones are uh, the main factors that affect early brain development. Yes? Yes. Um, I wonder, um, these days we have, for example, uh, uh, compounds that are released from plastic yes. into our food, which are actually simulating female hormones, as far as I know. Plus, I also know of the case of the soy milk for babies or soy formula for babies. Uh, and it also contains, just because soy as a plant contains, it's not genetically modified right. or anything, right. v uh, very, very high levels of uh, also female-like hormones. Mm -hmm. So I wonder if, for example, children are early on exposed to this, um, right. hormone-like substances, um, will this uh, affect their development? Yeah. yeah, that's an excellent question. So you're referring to endocrine disrupting compounds. And there's a great deal of concern and interest about those endocrine disrupting compounds because we already know in aquatic animals their sex can be reversed or are interfered with by the excessive amount of these chemicals in, in the water. There is a lot of research being done in our animal models to look at the effects of endocrine disrupting compounds. And at high enough doses, you can, in fact, uh, ha mimic genuine hormone exposure. The question is whether or not humans are being exposed to high enough doses. That's a very hard question to answer. And one of the really big challenges when you study something that affects development in a human that's not going to be manifest until an adult is that there's a 20-year period in between. So how we're going to be able to get a handle on who's been exposed to what and whether or not it's affected their adult behaviors is really, truly a challenge. Um, but there's no doubt that, that most of us living in Western cultures are carrying a load of, of these endocrine disruptors. And it just remains to be seen at this time whether or not it's having an effect on neurological development. To my mind, though, the, the, the answer is to not wait and see, but get them out of the environment as fast as we can. Um, can I then perhaps just uh, ask again, for example, uh, in the case of soy, uh, would you suggest that young children or babies, young children and so on, are fed with the soy? Or do we know something about the concentrations uh, yeah. and the effects? Yeah. We, we really don't. So soy uh, uh, mimics what's called genistein, which acts on a different kind of estrogen receptor called the ER beta, rather than the sort of the primary estrogen receptor ER alpha. Um, I do not know of much research being done on animal models in terms of soy. I would think that when people choose to put their children on soy milk, there's probably a good reason. There's some, uh, I would hope there's a good reason. There's an allergy to cow cow's milk or something. And I certainly wouldn't want to counsel anybody to stop using soy at this point. Because as I said, it's a, it has estrogenic effects, but in a different way than, say, uh, than like just straight estrogen, because it's the receptor that it acts on. Um, so. Uh, I, I think that it's, it's less of a problem, but you know, nobody can say for sure. Um, but if you've got a good reason, I, I wouldn't switch away.